Welcome to today's Entrepreneur, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business, presented by FL Montreal. My name is Dan Delmar, and filling in for my co-host Mike Newton tonight is our former co-host Josh Miller. Welcome back, Josh. Hello, Dan. How you uh, there's, doing? There's that hello. We missed you. Uh, I'm good. How are you? Uh, doing great, uh, notwithstanding all the craziness that has definitely happened this uh, this year. It's been uh, it's been quite the year. Um, tell us quickly, where have you been? Um, you've moved on from FL, uh, and you're, you're, you're in a very interesting business right now. Well, I am in, in aerospace and aviation, and, uh, but thankfully we're more on the defense sector, the military side. So, so we're not on the commercial side, which has obviously been devastated. And, uh, and as we know, in Montreal, we're big into aerospace here. So a lot of the commercial, uh, business has, let's just say people have had to got, get a little, um, little creative in what they do with their businesses. So thankfully that, and it's, uh, it's, it's a really interesting because it's not just Canada, it's worldwide. And the fact that this, uh, this pandemic is, is around the world, of course, uh, every single one of our locations gets affected. So never a dull moment. That's for sure. When you talk to your, your contacts internationally, are they optimistic about 2021 or, you know, what, what's the sentiment in the international business community right now? I think it depends where, like, right, basically we're Canada, US, Australia, and New Zealand. And I would say, uh, well, as we can see in the US, it's very divided. So some, some will say, yeah, you know, 2021 will be great. And others will say, well, what are you talking about 2021? It's 2022. I think from a New Zealand standpoint, uh, they, they have done a tremendous job of keeping their cases down to a minimum, as has Australia. But they've gone, certainly in New Zealand's case, a very, very strict lockdown. And that's what's put them in a great, great aspect or, or standpoint from, from the number of cases. The flip side of that coin is one of their largest industry, industries is tourism, and that's in the dumps. So the only way that that's going to come back is if they, if they loosen up a little bit. And where do you draw the line? And Australia, broken down by province, uh, as, as you might see, there's some provinces, like in Canada, there's some places that are doing well, some places that are not. But all in all, people are looking more towards the latter half of 2021 uh, to be a little bit more normal than, than the first. Excellent. And our profile this evening is Annick Damour from Trois Femmes Un Coussin. Not sure if they actually started with Un Coussin, but she's built it into a, a very interesting business that covers all kinds of homeware. Um, very beautiful art, uh, art for the home. And uh, Annick will join us in a little while. But first, Josh, uh, some news and notes uh, like we used to do back in the day. And this from Forbes.com, mistakes to avoid during a virtual meeting presentation. And I know at least one prominent pundit, a CNN pundit, got caught uh, literally with his pants down on Zoom. Uh, Josh, dress and go to work every morning is my advice for people that work from home. Dress and go to work every morning. It's, it's amazing how, how some people have kept their standards and, and, and in some cases elevated them. And others are like, well, what's the point? I'm home. You know, people will want me or like me for, for what I offer and not necessarily how I look. But Depend, and of course, it depends on what business you're in. You know, it's uh, certainly in the aviation side, it might be less important as we deal with, with governments and army bases around the world. But the reality is you still got to look a little bit professional, a little bit something, but forget the look, forget, the, forget that aspect of it. The technology, you know, make sure that at least it's working, you know, so that when you start a meeting at 3 p.m., it doesn't start at... 3 20 p.m. because you're trying to get all the things you know put together and sounding right and whatever so I, I think getting your technology down is absolutely a, an aspect to it no no question about it now that's on the back end certainly when you're talking about the the cnn and on the front end there's no question that uh that you could be very self-conscious uh, i know what i do i turn off my video so i don't have to look at myself when i talk because so I don't lose focus and lose concentration. Uh, that to me is uh, certainly helps me. You know, I try to look in the camera, although it's, it's, it's interesting because depending on the number of screens and, and how the setup is, your camera could be, your camera could be high up, but your, your image is down. So it looks like you're always looking down and not at the person in the eye. So I like to try and look at the camera or at least place the image as close to the lens as possible. Uh, little tricks that you can do to at least show that you're engaged in that conversation, because as we know, it's not the same as 
as being in the same room, even if you are six feet apart. And just, you know, keep the pants on. That's, that should be a basic. As well. and, and keep the pants on, or at least keep the camera above the waist. Uh, this from a Harvard Business Review, four ways to reconfigure your sales strategy during COVID. Um, I was never the best salesperson, but I, I feel uncomfortable um, pitching people at this time. I, I, feel, I, I feel like I'm a burden. Have you changed have the way you pitch people, Dan, like during this time? I haven't really done a whole lot of pitching lately, to be honest, for that very reason. I'm trying to create value through newsletters, through blogs, um, giving away some uh, crisis material, but I'm, I'm a little shy to pitch. And, uh, you know, certainly understandably so. And everybody, every character is different. And there's no question And when we talk to Anik a little later, we'll see that she's a couple of partners and they really try to play to their strengths. So Anik, between Anik and her partner Sandrin, they really try and, and do what each of them do best. Uh, for businesses and, you know, pitching or whatever, I, I understand maybe you need that other people in your organization and get the strengths up. That being said, find a way to get in front of your customer. You know, the, the reality is the sales experience today is not what it is or not what it was and might not be what it, what it was going forward. So find something a little bit unique, find something a little different. It's like an elevator pitch, you know, you got to find your opening line. Once you get your opening line, the rest should follow. For us, I think, and for a lot of millennial businesses, it's give away a bit of your time. That's, that's often what, uh, what it comes down to is just share your knowledge. I think that's always been that way. We've always professed in the, in the many years we've been doing the show, give to get, you know, do you, do you, can you give a little bit uh, and share what, what that knowledge you have, what a taste for what they can expect going forward. And in return, they, they, they'll hopefully build that, that trust or professional trust that, uh, that you'll take going with you going ahead. Let's welcome in our guest. She is the co-founder of Trois Femmes Un Cousset, Annick Damoul. Welcome, Annick, to today's Entrepreneur. Thank you. Thank you to have me. And, you know, the very first question, Dan, because I haven't asked it in a while, so I got to come to it, <laughs> just so that the listeners have an idea of exactly what is Trois Femmes et un Cousin. Anik, tell us, what is, a, what is your business about? Uh, Trois Femmes et un Cousin is a, is a multi-business. Actually, we do import, resell. We are, a, uh, we are a reseller and importers of uh, Art de la Table, which means uh, glassware, uh, porcelain, china, cutlery first for hotel and restaurants and we do have a business for retail and i i know we're going to get a little bit to how covid has affected you later certainly on the on the restaurant uh side of your business but before we get there uh, when did you start this business how long ago 20 years ago yeah what were you doing before then like did, were you doing something similar that are you and your partners at the time not at all. <laughs> Actually, I study, I've done two BAs, one in cinema and one in communication. My partner study graphism and, uh, our, you know, graphic design. And, um, and we were working in, working in a restaurant at the time while we were studying. And then I, and I was very into magazines and art de vivre and I couldn't find anything interesting in Montreal. So I was just like, I started my own collection and uh, I was working with Sandrine, which was just like a, like a restaurant colleague. And uh, she was painting at the time. And I asked her if she wants to join me in that kind of, uh, it wasn't a business at the time. I didn't know what I was doing at all. <laughs> and where, where, did the, uh, where did the idea come from? Was the idea of the three of you or? Uh, no, actually it's because I bought a house at the time and my, um, my boyfriend was living in Paris and uh, that sounds like very, you know, like glamorous, but it wasn't. Anyway, so so then we bought a house in Montreal and I was getting my stuff in Paris because I couldn't find anything in Montreal. Then I was buying magazines and, and so and so. So I wanted to bring Art de Vivre, the Allure Européenne in, uh, in Montreal. So, and, but I had all my ideas, but I'm, I'm not an artist. I'm just like someone with, with ideas. And Sandrine is an artist. So I was thinking that she might... Uh, can paint on the dishes so it was very like you know like very artsy fartsy at the beginning and <laughs> so so this retail store i mean you you have your own designs or you've gotten designs from from like you say from at Paris the beginning or? i'm sorry to interrupt. uh at the beginning uh we uh we bought the 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 porcelain from from stores in montreal and then we were painting on them our own design 
And then that was like, you know, it couldn't, couldn't last. But when we started, when we launched the, the company, because um, we were doing cushion as well. So we were three, three ladies and we were making cushions and we were painting and painting on the, on the dishes. Uh, so when we started, the com- when we launched the, the business, uh, all the restaurants owners and people we were working with, they were just like, oh, we want our own like dishes, like, uh, you know, custom dishes. And, and nobody was really into cushions. So we were like, okay, so let's reorient our like, uh, our business and let's concentrate on, uh, on restaurants and, and on like custom dishes. And we didn't know how to do custom dishes. We didn't know how to import. We didn't know where to get the plates. So, yeah. How, how far into your, your start did this happen? Was this very quickly on? Um, yeah, it, it, everything happened in a year. We just like, after like a few months, we were just like, okay, that's it for the cushion. Let's find a, a line in France. And, you know, like 20 years ago, like there was internet, but not that much. So we find a line in, in France and then there was that show in Chicago. So I flew to Chicago, met this person, like, you know, like uh, director of marketing international and so and so. So I convinced him to have the line in, uh, in Canada at the time, you know, it was like, oh, Canada. And um, so we just ordered our first, uh, our first order and, you know, we didn't have any money. So we went to see all, we ordered some samples. We went to see all our like, friends were working in restaurants they put a deposit and with that money we bought our first order <laughs> you learned you learned about cash flow quickly yeah 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 actually yeah and Nick, I'm curious, um, few artists, uh, you know, uh, endeavor to go into B2B. How did you get used to that idea and when did you decide that that was that was the time to make the pivot? We just learned like from, from scratch. So there wasn't any like, okay, let's do B2B or let's do this. Cause it just, it just came naturally. And, you know, we first import and then, and then it was restaurants and that was our big business for until now. It's still, how, how about does, the last few months. How does uh, a new business kind of rookie entrepreneurs go to <laughs> Paris and get designers to agree to sell them your product? I don't know. I guess that was uh, convincing or a bit, uh, you know, like when you start a business, you don't know what, what you're getting into. Uh, but when you really want this to work and to happen, you just, if, if you're not like convinced of what you're doing, of course, you're not going to convince them. But if you take a flight and then you go to Paris and you want to convince them, it's because you are convinced. Did and, you have? Did I'm you? Sorry. Did you have? That's okay. Did you? Did you have like a written agreement? Did you? Did they just trust you? Was it like how did how did you ink that deal, so to speak? You know, in in uh, in Europe, they they do a lot of uh, handshake agreement, like and and at the beginning, I didn't want to get into an agreement because you know I couldn't like uh, you know like tell them that I was I will buy in the next few years like a. Two million dollars of, uh, of dishes. Like it was hard for me to, you know, to tell to tell them that I can do this and I can do that. So the, the handshake for me was kind of cool at the beginning. Then when 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 we get bigger, I was like, okay, we need a contract. So then I hire. Uh, then you know, I ask our uh, lawyer about that, and he was like, you know what, I need? even if you have like a very strong like, partnership agreement. If you know, if the 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 factory closed tomorrow, like what are you gonna do? Even if you have like an agreement, so why don't you just focus on your business, which is your branding, because your branding is always gonna be the same. Even if you change uh, the company you're gonna sell, and even if you change your partnership with people, and I was like, that was a great advice. No, listen, at the end of the day, you can put a lot on paper. There's no question about it. You can try and cover your rear end to the nth degree. But from Absolutely. a practical standpoint, you can't always protect it, or it might not be worth it to go chase after that mistake. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when somebody is overseas and, you know, where's the, where's the best bang for the buck for the entrepreneur? Trois femmes et un cousin. You were three partners. Yeah. You're no longer three partners, correct? No. No, no, there's only, I mean, there's only and I, Patricia uh, left the boat like um, 
I would say, 15 years ago. She, um, she got pregnant, she had a baby and she wanted to stay home with her baby, so. Was that, was that okay? Was it a difficult kind of breakup or a partner departure? Um, it was at the beginning, you know, it's always like sensitive because you're like, you know, it, it's just sensitive. It's like your, your relationship is, uh, is, you know, is, it's like someone is breaking up with you, but, uh, we, we are in very good relations still now. now Did you, was there a financial breakup as well? Did you have a shareholder's agreement? Did you, <laughs> the thing, the thing is, you know, when she left, we were like, you know, we were make any money. It was like maybe Four years after the business, we, we started the business, so we were still in in debts, and so we didn't give her like a third of the debts we had. We just said, okay, let's leave it that way. <laughs> and Nick, uh, it's been it's been tough for a lot of retailers, uh, certainly people that have a lot of web based businesses. Um, how has this this crazy year been for you? Uh, it was uh, <laughs> very bad. <laughs> I cannot choose a better word. It was very bad in terms of like 85% of our business is hotel, restaurants, and corporation. And uh, 45% of our total year is in May, uh, April, May, and June. So we lost like 45% of our business in three months. Uh, so it was, um, it was terrible at the beginning because you, you don't know what's going to happen. And uh, and then you're like, okay, so there's no way, there's no way this is gonna kill my business. So, so you just roll your <laughs> your shirt and uh, you 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 know you focus on what's good and um, you find solution. And there's there's no question. There's a lot of strategies you can do. And and I know you you built recently uh, an e-commerce site, and we'll come to that in a moment because that's mm -hmm. always interesting to to hear about. But let's just like kind of get down to the, to the dollars and cents behind it and not necessarily revealing numbers, but you, when you started your business originally, you were self-finance or were there, was there a bank involved? Uh, we were self-finance big time. I mean, like the three of us at the beginning when we were three, like our like tips money were, were paying our like uh, business cards and uh, that's, you know, it's, it's like exactly what was it all about. It was our tips that we were making in restaurants that was financing that, that project at the time. It was really a project. And then we, uh, then we got a, a subvention or a prize. It was a prize. We win that prize for a plan d'affaires, business plan. And that gives us like $12,000. So we could surf on that. So we bought our first, you know, like not equipment, but uh, uh, I mean, like uh, goods and, you know, plates mm -hmm. and, and uh, matière première, and then we got a, um, and then we got a, a loan from the BDC because because at the beginning we didn't know how to do custom plates, but you need a, you know, you need a, an oven for that, so we have to buy an oven. <laughs> it's not an oven; it's a it's a kiln. Yeah, it's a kiln, yeah. yeah Whatever to, to cook the paint on the on exactly. The so we bought a kiln. So we uh, and then my mother uh, signed to get a small uh, credit line. And then uh, after a few years, we, we were able to, you know, make it happen. How, how was it dealing with kind of your banks or financial partners, if I can put it, back then? And what were they like? How have they been this year? Uh, the bank were very, I mean, this year was incredible. I mean, it was incredible for us in terms of we are a solid business now. So it's not like they were like, it's like you know, the first six months, because uh, our financial uh, year started on October 1st. So the first six months of our year was just amazing. We never had such a good year. So it was easy to just call the bank and said, okay, this is it, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, with the government help as well, you know, it was, we could, you know, it was easy for us. I'm not saying that it was easy for everyone, but in, in terms of us, you know, strong and solid company, which I consider we are, um, you know, we could have a very good, you know, very good deal with the banks. And your location, you're located in the plateau, right? Yeah. <laughs> have you always been in that space? Um, almost. We've been here. We've been on the plateau for 16 years. Yeah. But we're off Broadway. We're not on a commercial street. And is that location been good for you? Like, why that location? Uh, because at the time... We heard that location was getting uh, 
was getting, getting vacant and available. And because we were working with restaurants, we didn't want them to think that we were going retail and they're going to lose their kind of a, we have a very, very special and uh, beautiful uh, relationship with our uh, restaurants and hotel uh, clientele so we wanted to keep that we didn't want to move into like a, a commercial street and start being like a boutique mm-hmm. there was and no boutique at the time <laughs> no and being a boutique in and of itself is is a marketing strategy right because it's Absolutely. a little cachet it's a little you're not meant for the masses um was that one of your your more successful marketing decisions were there any other marketing efforts uh, and I know I'm leading into the e-commerce site during COVID, but even before there, uh, was there um, anything else? That again, it wasn't like, it wasn't planned. I mean, we probably have a, had a certain uh, nose for going at the right place at the right moment. Uh, it, you know, it's our boutique is very niche. So people are coming to a boutique. They're not like, you know, bump into the boutique sometimes, yes. But uh, the fact that we are like at this place it just give us a certain you know like how mm-hmm. can I say that uh, je ne sais quoi, uh, je ne sais quoi. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way <laughs> so so now now we're kind of you know we're talking about marketing there's as we've seen in many businesses uh during COVID where there's limited face-to-face contact online business online transactions uh it was hard to escape that reality Mm-hmm. or that necessity for any business. Did you have, how was your website before COVID? How is it today? And how has been that, what's been the, the, the most difficult point to get from A to B? Uh, it's two world. Uh, if we compare six months ago and now, uh, we had a, a, a website, but it was like, we nobody never told us until now, until like six months ago that our website was like bad, like very bad, old, website but the thing is people were not people don't buy dishes on the web not a lot even though now that we have a new beautiful website it's uh it's because if people wants to feel and touch but uh from from march until now now we have a shopify new website uh, we had help from this generous amazing president of a company big company who does shopify uh, website who help us pro bono to start to start building that new website and uh, Sandrine did all the work for the last four months she's been working days and night to put everything in the website now we have a beautiful very sexy website we <laughs> you, we just love it <laughs> was it difficult was it a, I know I know it was more Sandrine you were explaining that was involved but mm-hmm. was it was it a lengthy process to get up and running or is it not as daunting or as scary as, as it is, especially when you're using a good a good background? Actually, we do have beautiful products. We do have beautiful pictures. We have taste. Um, we knew where we wanted to go, so uh, it just it it just it means a lot of work. It's a lot of hours. If you don't have like three thousand dollars to spend on a website, you need a thirty thousand hours <laughs> to to. Uh, to spend on it. No question. And there's, and I'm sure there's also, if forget the, the, the visuals in front, there's a lot of back end. You have to collect a lot of information. You have to make mm-hmm. sure it's, it's set up properly. There's confidential information. Uh, we won't even go into the cybersecurity behind it. That's, that's kind of a whole other level in discussion. Uh, and, and I guess there's, there's all that setup, which, which I know is, is crucial to setting up that website. And, uh, and we want to hear more about that from you, but also we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about, more about that from a tax side of things as well. And uh, Josh, we're going to finish off uh, with Annick Demour from Trois Femmes Un Coussin and her one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur coming up in a few minutes. But first, we go to Ernie Furt, FL Tax Partner, for some advice on e-commerce and sales tax. Ernie, welcome back to CJD. Always a pleasure. And I know, uh, Josh, Ernie knows uh, the difference between doing e-commerce in Delaware and versus e-commerce in Michigan and all these different rules uh, across American states especially, but we won't do all 50 states, maybe just the basics tonight. Well, that, that's the whole thing. It's e-commerce. It could be worldwide. So there's, there's so many rules and aspects behind it, but the basics are still there. Uh, you know, the basics of, because it also depends, are you a service business or are you shipping product? 
but we're not going to steal from Ernie's thunder just yet. You're doing uh, quite well. Keep going. Yeah. I'll correct as you go along. That's no, fine. Not at all. I, I, I guess e-commerce is not new to us, but there's no question that there's still a lot of detail behind it. So Ernie, when somebody says, you know, I'm launching an e-commerce site, what are the first challenges that come to mind? Well, first of all, one of the biggest challenges is how you're going to do it. Are you going to do it yourself? Are you going to go to Shopify? Are you going to go to Amazon? How are you going to go to Amazon? You know, what, what, are, what are your plans effectively as to how you want to approach the e-commerce world? Because some people like to do it themselves. Some people like to do a combination. Some people say, I don't want to have anything to do with it. Let, let Amazon do it. Let Shopify do it. So that's the first question. Then the next question is, what do you want your customer to have at the end of the day? Do you want seamless service whereby they get the good at their premises, all delivered, all paid, no mystery bills coming in the mail from Canada Post or the Canada Revenue Agency or anything like that or a state government? Um, it's all. It's basically what you want. And what you want, it can be designed, you know, depending on where you're going to do the business. Oh, I don't want to sell into such and such a place. Okay, so we won't. So we won't deal with that province or state. But a lot of people say, I just want to sell. I want to sell everywhere I possibly could. So then we have to take a look at where we want to do that sale. Let's, let's focus on Canada first. And exactly. And, and let's say we're dealing with a product. I mean, Anika is experiencing selling a product from her location. And, you know, she, if somebody wants to, if somebody's sitting in Michigan and wants to buy it and she's shipping it there, does she have to worry about it differently than if somebody is sitting in the plateau three blocks away from her? Um, it's all still online, but how does how does that work? Well, there, there's differences and there's different thresholds in different jurisdictions, especially in the United States. And each, each of those jurisdictions are different. And either it goes by number of sales that you make in that particular jurisdiction in the U.S., or alternatively, it, 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 you just decide to register in that state pay and charge that tax to the individual because the states are different than Canada because they're going to, they, they won't necessarily mail you something. They're going to kind of force you to self-assess on your personal tax return. That's that use tax line. If you've ever seen that on a state tax return. So, you know, U S is, it's very peculiar. Each state is different and it's, it's a, it's a minefield if you're going into the U S and it's a lot easier. And Nick, when you were going through that, I mean, some of the background information, uh, and if, if this was more Sandrine, that's okay, we can move on. Did you, did you have to kind of think where you were shipping to and, and how, that, how that online process worked? We never, we, like, like, um, like Ernie said before, uh, you know, like the minefield we're not interested in, you know, like sometimes we, we never want to be like huge and big and take the entire world because I like to have like uh, I like to sleep at night and you know like just not thinking about you know all those kind of uh, logistic at all. So it was Canada only. We do we do ship a little bit in the states because we have those we used to have tourists coming to our stores, but uh, yeah. but mainly it's it's Canada and uh, we're not very very into getting into those complicated laws and. The, nece the necessary evils of the world. Ernie, there's a, there's, a, there's a big difference between when you're selling services and when you're selling product. Um, when you're selling product, I would imagine you, you know where exactly where you're shipping and sales tax rules, at least in Canada, are fairly clear. What if you're selling a service? Uh, if I'm selling a service, generally I sell the service, it's, a, it's based on bill to and not necessarily where the service is rendered or, or, or a ship to, because there is no ship to. There's effectively a bill to, uh, depending on the type of service, there's a lot of varying place of supply rules on services. You know, you could have services like getting a haircut, that's a, a, a local service, and that's going to be charged GSD, QSD. You have other services like doing an inventory count in a jurisdiction, which the, the bank in Toronto has asked you to do, but the inventory count is, is in New Brunswick. So you have to charge New Brunswick sales tax rate on that. So there's a lot of different rules on services. There's a publication called B103 on the federal website that talks about all these different places supply rules for services. Goods, pretty easy. It's uh, based on bill to, not, uh, 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 sorry, based on ship to, pardon me, and not bill to. So you wanna buy a present for, you, for your brother uh, that lives in BC, 
you'll, you'll, you'll charge into GST and possibly the provincial sales tax in BC. No, and it's and like you said, Ernie, it's a it's a minefield. There's so much information, and again, your services. Then you gotta maybe think of IP addresses and where somebody's coming from. So there's a whole whole slew of information that uh, that that are challenging for entrepreneurs. We can thank you very much. Show on it. Thanks very much, Ernie. Uh, much appreciated. And as we do each week, and I haven't asked this question in a little while, but I'm really happy to be asking it of Anik. Uh, Anik. What would be your one piece of advice for today's entrepreneur? After COVID, I would say when facing adversity, take a step back, look at the old picture and see it as an opportunity to make things better. Thank you very much, Anik. Uh, definitely wise words. My quick takeaway is kind of like that. You, you, know, you have to reinvent yourself. We've said it often on the show. You have to reinvent yourself when you, when you have to. And don't take long to do that because sometimes you don't have that time to pivot. Correct. And Nick, thanks so much. And, uh, and your optimism uh, after a tough year is a breath of fresh air. Thanks for joining us on the show tonight. Thanks. Thanks to you. Thanks to having me here. Thanks as well to Ernie Furt and to you, Josh Miller. So nice to have you back. We'll have you back uh, perhaps once more in a few months time. I would look forward to that, Dan. Uh, that's uh, so much fun. I miss well, it. Well, thanks for thanks for your insight as well. And uh, we'll be back in two weeks here on Today's Entrepreneur. Don't forget todaysentrepreneur.org for over a decade worth of shows hosted by Josh uh, to inspire you and your entrepreneur friends. And we'll be back here in a couple of weeks.